My name is Jacqueline Saragosa McGilfrey, and I am an artist and the curator at Blue Star Contemporary, um, a museum and nonprofit space in San Antonio, Texas. And we're focused on contemporary art, as our name implies. And I am going to be sharing with you today some advice for applying for stuff and approaching curators. Um, so hopefully this helps you, um, artists out there, um, make progress in, in your artistic practice and pursue opportunities um, and maybe clarify some things that are uncertain for you about um, getting opportunities to um, exhibit your work. That's mostly what I'll be focused on, talking about things that apply to exhibiting your work, but, um, but it could apply to applying for other opportunities as well. So first I'm going to want to start with talking about what types of materials should you expect to include in an application. So there are core kind of materials that a lot of applications ask for and um, so you can you can read their the application guidelines in advance um, but these are things that you should always kind of have prepared and be updating for yourself whether it's to have it on your website or knowing like that you're constantly going to be applying for for opportunities um, I'm sure that some some of you apply for a lot of opportunities a year and maybe you get a yes to a couple of them um, so yeah, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to be intentional about what you apply for. So um, one thing that is commonly asked for is your CV or also referred to as a resume. So when an application asks for this, it's not they're not asking for your professional resume, um, your employment resume. What a CV includes are things like your exhibition record, your education and training as an artist, even if you're self-taught. Um, or you've done workshops or whatever form that training looks like, um, acknowledging uh, an accumulation of years that you've dedicated to developing your, your tech, the technical side of your, your practice and the conceptual side. So that's what you need to figure out. If you don't have tradi traditional education or a formal education in, in your medium or in art, think about how you can translate um, your investment in your practice, how you can translate that um, um, and create an equivalent for that. Um, any professional experience you have, so you might um, want to highlight things that you've done professionally that are not necessarily in exhibition, so maybe that is your employment if you're working in, in the field of art. Um, maybe you um, were a guest lecturer for a year somewhere, um, maybe you've taught workshops, whatever professional experience reflects, again, an investment in your practice. That's really what you're showing is that you are a serious artist, you take your artistic career um, seriously, and you, in, and you invest in it. Um, any lectures that you've participated in, um, whether it's a formal lecture, you know, for a university or for a gallery, something like that, or if it's an informal artists talk to a small group to uh, just uh, one classroom or something like that. But any kind of those kind of professional things that you do as an artist that are about your work or that are also about investing in your community, in your arts community or your community at large, those are also things to that are important to highlight. Um, things like publications, articles about your work, reviews about your work, you're also going to include those on your CV. Um, and again, what you want this to demonstrate is that you invest in your practice in your artistic career. So that's the kind of stuff that you should highlight on your CV. Um, often applications will ask you for a letter of intent or a specific project proposal. Maybe you're applying for an ex a specific exhibition opportunity and you have to um, tell them what the exhibition would be. Um, lots of times they don't because you're maybe applying for something a year or two out. It's they they understand that those ideas can change or develop over time. So don't don't get too hung up on it. Um, but 
show, make it show that you are thinking through a concept, you're thinking through an idea, maybe it's a project you've already started on that's in development, or that's pretty far along and you're looking for that opportunity to showcase it. Um, so it, your letter of intent will express why you believe you should be chosen for the, that specific opportunity. So you might have a little bit of boilerplate about a project or about your practice, but you want to make sure that you are being specific to each opportunity, whether that's in a short paragraph or whatever. Um, their prompt might um, make you do this anyways, but um, you want to make sure to express why you believe that this opportunity is right for you. It's right for this body of work and that you deserve to, to be awarded it. Um, and how do you think the, the experience or this opportunity will influence your practice? Um, and you should then those kind of questions or whatever questions they provided in the prompt should be clearly articulated. So they should be able to say, oh, that's the answer to this question. Um, how, it should be legible. It should be easy to read. It should be engaging. Um, and, and it should be succinct. Most of the time, they, the, these types of letters are requested be, to be between 400 and 700 words. A lot of them are kind of on that 500 word mark. Um, so yeah, be intentional, be, make sure it's read really readable, reader friendly, and that it expresses why you should, why it should go to you. Um, the next thing that you will always be asked for as a visual artist is an image portfolio of your work. Um, usually this is around 15 to 20 images. Sometimes it's a really specific opportunity like a group show and they might only want five images of the exact works that you would want to show. But a lot of times the portfolio is really to get an understanding of your body of work as an artist, who you are, what your, what your style is. Um, and what you should think about when you're selecting those images is does this does the content of your work provoke discussion? Does it pr provoke thought? If you're applying for a solo exhibition, does the work feel like it's strong enough to be awarded the solo exhibition? Even if this isn't the exact work that would be exhibited, lots of times it's not. Lots of times you're pr uh, applying for an opportunity that's a year or two or maybe even more down the, down the road. If it's like a public art commission, those projects take a long time. But the work should should demonstrate your professionalism and your artistry so it shows that what you make is strong enough to to have a solo exhibition or to be awarded whatever that opportunity is um, does it demonstrate mastery over your medium or intentional execution um, so what i mean by that is um you know say you're working with cardboard or some or some unconventional material you still need to show that you executed that work intentionally it's not it's not sloppy it's not it's still well made um, there's still intentionality behind it it's it's you're still it, there's still a commitment in the development of that artwork um, are the concept and idea at the forefront of the work um, for us at, at blue star contemporary that's really important we're not solely focused on um, maybe a uh, craft or um, things that are solely maker oriented. So there, there always needs to be a strong conceptual side to, to the work. Um, would you describe the style, theme, subject of your work to be contemporary and relevant to the discourse of art and culture? So um, you are all contemporary living artists. If you are, again, applying to a space like Blue Star that is focused on contemporary art, those are the kind of questions that we're asking when we're reviewing a portfolio of images. Um, lots of applications will ask you also for a letter of recommendation. So a recommendation letter should be from somebody who knows your work and has seen you, you as an artist progress. Who you ask these letters from are, is really important. You want them to be able to speak to your work and your practice. Um, they can be a mentor, an instructor, maybe you have a good, maybe you have a commercial gallerist um, and um, you have a good relationship with them and they've worked with you for many years, that would be a great person. Um, a colleague and sometimes a peer. Um, but I think sometimes you want somebody who, depending on the opportunity, who 
is maybe there's uh, more of a mentorship or um, they've had um, been a guide to you in some way so that they can really speak to your development. Um, can, again, be intentional considering who the letter is coming from and can they make a compelling case for you, the applicant. That's really what they're doing. They're advocating for you to be awarded this opportunity. Um, if you happen to, you know, ha have an artist who's a friend that's maybe a little bit more high profile or well known in your community or, you know, nationally or internationally, um, there it's going to mean a lot coming from them. Um, maybe it's another curator who you had a great experience working with on a project and they have a lot to say about your work. Maybe they've even written essay, an essay about your work or um, a description about your work. So they're somebody who has sat and thought a lot about your, thought a lot about your work and framing your work. Um, so they can probably make a compelling case for you. Um, make sure that you give your recommender plenty of time to write the letter and not asking them a couple days before. So this goes back to um, looking at what the guidelines for opportunities are, giving yourself plenty of time to apply for things, and, um, and in turn giving that recommender plenty of time. Um, so also when you're looking at what opportunities to apply for, and deciding, you don't, I, I would say, be in, again, be intentional. You don't need to apply for every single thing that's out there um, or everything that comes your way or say the deadline's like two or three days away. Do you want to rush that application and have an application that, that's not as strong and that might leave an impression on the curator or the jurors? Or do you want you, you want to say, oh, you know, for that, I'm going to wait until next year. What else is what else is out there right now that I that I want to apply for? So when you're selecting those opportunities beyond timeline, you want to really look at the organization that you're applying to and thinking about is is that a good fit for you? So become familiar with who the who the organizations are, who the galleries are that you're applying to, what's their mission, what is their exhibition program look like. So maybe it's heavy on photography and you're a painter or vice versa. That might not be a good fit for you or it might be unlikely that your work will be selected. Um, maybe they're craft oriented or a culturally specific organization. Um, you should know those things before you apply, before you spend your time applying. Um, because again, that might not be the right fit for you. So you really want to think about what you're applying to and be intentional about that. Um, you also, when you're deciding on an organization or an opportunity to apply for, you want to think about, is it going to be an opportunity for, for professional growth? So, and this kind of comes back to like, uh, um, how the how the opportunity will impact you that's something that's compelling that you can that you can express in your application is that by get, being given this opportunity you're only going to grow and flourish as an artist and most organizations are intentional about the who they're awarding their opportunities to and they want those opportunities whether it's an exhibition or or doing workshops or whatever to really have an impact on the artists that they're in, engaging and the those resources to be put to good use um, think about when you're working on your application, will the jurors or the curators, the, does, the, does your work spark curiosity or make them anticipate what you're going to make next? Um, that is, you know, going back to um, them being excited about your work. Um, will you be able to introduce your work to curators whose work you respect? Um, so w when you select an opportunity, what I mean by that, say there's a, say there's a panel of jurors or a single juror or curator that's selected for the opportunity. Maybe you're, maybe it's a long shot that you're going to get the opportunity. Does that always mean you shouldn't apply? No. Sometimes that it, it's as simple as so-and-so is, is the juror or so-and-so is going to review the work and I just want to be able to introduce my work to that curator. Um, so think about the diversity of opportunities um, that are that are there for you 
through submitting an application. Sometimes it's as simple as that. You want to introduce your work to an organization or introduce who you are to an organization or to a juror or to a curator. Um, and whether or not there's a, an exhibition outcome or the other outcome that you're applying for, it's still maybe worth applying to. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is um, kind of the do's and don'ts of when you're when you're um, developing your applications. And these are lots of things that, some, these are some things that I've seen over time. So um, either as a, as a guest juror for things or um, at Blue Star, in addition to um, being introduced to work through, through exhibitions or through recommendation or um, going to art fairs or what have you. Um, I, we also ha host various open calls um, over uh, over the years, and sometimes those those open calls can have up to 500 applications. Sometimes the more directed ones have more like 250. Um, but that's there's a lot of applications that we're going through. So I've gone through thousands of applications um, over the over my six and a half years at Blue Star. And so these are some things that I've seen over and over again that we can. Um, artist applications. So the first thing would be submitting less than the minimum of allotted images. So um, say the platform that you're using allows for a range, so that's like 50, you know, 15 to 20 or 10 to 15, whatever it is. And an, if an artist only uses 10 or whatever the minimum amount that is, rather than using all of the allotted space that they have, all of the allotted um, uploads that they have, that kind of makes me question, do they have a extensive portfolio of work? Um, so it might communicate that maybe you're new to your practice and you're not quite ready for the opportunity. It might also just communicate that um, you're not taking the application process seriously itself. And so you're rushing through it. You didn't give yourself enough time. You're not being thoughtful about what you're uploading. Um, so those are, you know, various things that kind of raise a little bit of a red flag when you don't upload your your maximum allotted um, images. Also, sometimes I see too many images of the same piece. Again, a similar thing like, uh, do they not have that extensive of a body of work? If they've dedicated five uploads, that's a lot, um, to, to one artwork. Why, you know, why have they dedicated so many to that one piece? Um, so there, sometimes there are exceptions, you know, maybe it's a large scale installation and you really need that many images and that's like a project you spent two years on and it's a huge project or something like that. Um, but most of the time it, 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 that's not the case. Most of the time it's, it kind of feels like it's just trying to fill the space. Um, or fill the fill out the application, but it seems like there's not a lot of work in the artist portfolio. Um, the the letter of interest um, is short and really brief. It's you're not taking advantage again of the word count that you have to make a compelling case to talk about your work. Um, and something else I didn't touch on, um, which is kind of connected to letter of interest, is. Um, your artist statement, which will which is asked for a lot in applications as well. Um, and I'll just digress for a second to to touch on artist statements. Um, your artist statement, um, again, is uh, uh, around that same like 500 word count a lot of the time or about one page or a page and a half. I would hesitate to recommend going a longer than a page, especially think about it on the the reviewer side. You could be again reviewing like 200 to 500 applications, and them getting all beyond uh, one page in length starts to get really cumbersome and, and long. And again, you should be able to express yourself succinctly and clearly. And with those with those artist statements, the pitfall I see a lot is that they read really dispassionately. They're very like matter of fact um, or um, very academic um, in, in a way that is, it's not compelling, it's not digestible. It's, and when you read hundreds of those, 
the language is all the same, the tone is all the same. Um, so when somebody does write about their work passionately or write about what they're interested in as an artist and in like this transparent, honest, honest way, then that comes, then that is so much more enjoyable to read. That's so, it's so much more readable it, and the artist stands out. Um, nine times out of 10, I can tell when somebody has just finished their MFA program because the tone of the tone of the uh, their artist statement and their letters really read like they're coming out of that context. Um, so not to say that there's not a place for that writing and sometimes that place is your artist statement, but when you're thinking about what makes a compelling application, um, your tone and why you care about your work and why other people should care about that work should be still, no matter how academic it is, should be communicated through your writing. Um, your, uh, again, same as letter of interest. Um, does it sound really uninterested? Like you don't sound excited about the opportunity at all. Um, I've read those where it, it's, you know, it was short. It was really, like I said, like I'm saying, uninterested. They, they sound uninterested in this letter. So I'm like, okay, it doesn't really sound like you are, you want this opportunity. Um, um, other materials, your letter of recommendation, some with some opportunities, I've seen um, multiple, multiple people having a letter of recommendation from the same person. Um, and so maybe that's more for like a local, local call or something. Um, that you want to think about when, when if something's asking for a letter of recommendation, you want to ask your recommender, did somebody already ask you to write this? Or are you writing a letter for anybody else for this opportunity? That, that recommendation is going to have a lot less weight if they've recommended five other people. Um, it's just no matter how, how compelling it is, them having recommended that many people for the same opportunity is not going to hold very much weight. Um, poor documentation of artwork. So I see this a lot in applications. Again, all it does is a disservice to your work to have poor documentation of your artwork. Um, and this, this can manifest in a variety of ways. Maybe it's a really low resolution photograph. Um, maybe you didn't take the time to position your work with like a blank wall, even just like a blank wall behind it, a blank back background, but you see all this stuff in your studio behind the artwork and it's, it's distracting to the work. Um, maybe it's really poorly lit. That's, you know, all of those kind of technical things that you think about in composing an image. But that said, even with not that professional of equipment, you should be able to get pretty good documentation as long as you're framing it nicely, you have good, you know, good lighting, um, you know, then if you have, you know, modest resources of even simply your phone, the camera on your phone, you should still be able to compose a good image of, of your work and, and document it clearly. Um, and similarly, um, there are some mediums um, or some practices that it's, it's hard to figure out how to present those digitally or to communicate those through a still image or a video clip. Um, but as an artist, it's your job to figure out what is the most compelling way to do that. And so there are some instances where I've seen an artwork in person and the documentation of it does not give, you know, give it justice. Um, or it's, um, yeah, it's just poor representation of how how good and strong the work is. Um, so your your documentation does a does a lot for your work, and some stuff some work is harder to communicate materially than others. Um, but you, as the artist, need to figure out what how to do that. So um, whether that's just documenting the same the same work over and over again, different ways and figuring out, okay, what actually communicates this materially, physically, and gives them a sense of how, how powerful this work is. 
um, composite images. So what I mean by this is if they if the application allots for you know in one upload on one file you have multiple images of the same piece, it just looks cluttered. It looks like you're just trying to sneak in more images or figure out a way to include more than the allotted images. Um, and it, yeah, it just it, it's making those images smaller as well because you're putting multiple on on one on one uh, file. And so again, that's not the strongest presentation of your work. Um, not reading or following the guidelines for submitting. So I see that a lot as well. Again, with things like making composite images or not including the description of the artwork, um, leaving something out, maybe or having a word count that's too big or too small, um, that's you know less than the minimum or more than the maximum, all of those little things. What that, repre what that represents to me is your level of professionalism, how thorough you are in reading through the guidelines. Um, it communicates what it might be like to work with you and correspond with you. So that, that, that application process is, is more than just looking at your work, but it's the first impression to you as the artist and what it could be like to work with you. Um, the last thing is submitting images of in-progress work. So some applications might ask for that because it's to help support the completion of, of a work, but um, a, lot of, a lot of applications are wanting a complete portfolio. And so showing me something that is you know, half made and it's like a, cr again, like a crummy documentation and, um, and it's not well framed that all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then those kind of like thrown in with the completed work, it kind of throws off the, the flow of, of the, um, of the application. And I would also say, be selective about how many exhibition style, like exhibition documentation photos, you use. Sometimes those take up a lot of somebody's application and while it shows the work exhibited and like good for you but it doesn't always it's not always a good representation of of your body of work and especially to dedicate uh, multiple uploads to to exhibition photographs simply to demonstrate that you've had an exhibition. What's more important is showing the quality of your work um, and um, also when, when necessary, which is for a lot of work, is the, the reviewer getting a sense of the physicality of your, of your work. Um, sometimes that's, that's a real challenge for, for a lot of artists. So next I wanna to talk to you about um, approaching curators and plugging into your communities. And this feeds back to applying for stuff because um, it's, it's really thinking about how do you secure opportunities as an artist? And um, I want to talk about plugging into your community in tandem with approaching curators because you should understand that um, both are about building relationships. And while a lot of times you're applying for things further afield, I think what in the long term what becomes more important to you as an artist is the the direct community that you build, especially if you live out, you know, if you don't live on the coast, um, that which it's probably just as important there. But you know, those spaces are maybe more international. And when you are living in most cities in the U.S. or most towns in the U.S., the community that you build in those spaces is is really important, and and that is what not only feeds your opportunities as an artist, but it also feeds you as an artist. It feeds you as a person and it feeds your practice. Um, so by building a relationship, um, I mean that you are having conversations with people, you're going to openings and you're meeting people, um, you're, maybe you have a, a network of a network of artists that you went to school with, continuing with those relationships that you built. Maybe you have a, um, an instructor who was a good mentor to you, um, continue to nurture those relationships. And in a similar sense, that's how you should approach meeting curators. So it's not about 
hi, you're the juror for this, or hi, I really want you to curate my work into a show. Um, that can be kind of off-putting. Um, it's that's very that's transactional, um, and and you want to focus on developing relationships. And I, if you're a young artist or just kind of trying to get plugged into a community, sometimes artists refer to think of this as like this is got, I have to be really social and I'm not a social person or this is like schmoozing or rubbing elbows or, or this is, you know, clicky or something. And I think that those are perspectives a lot of the times when you're, when you're on the outside of something and that's, and really what, what that is a lot of the time is that you haven't invested the time. And so from the outside, it can feel like that, but really what it is, is that, these people have worked on building relationships with one another, and you need to do that same work. Um, and um, and being social is somewhat a part of that, um, but that's not to say that you have to be like a really chatty person or go to every single thing. There are people that love to do that stuff, but when you do go to things, you should be intentional. Make the people that are there that 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 you're going to it. You're going to it to support them. You're not just going to it for your for your own gain. Um, of course, you'll you'll benefit uh, and hopefully be be educated by those experiences. But it's really about building relationships with people. And once you start to build those relationships and become plugged into a community, it's not going to feel like you know. It's not going to feel painful to socialize or like you're going to meet all the, be around all these strangers because as you invest in the community, then that becomes your community. Those become your friends. Those become your peers. Um, and so it's, it's going to be fun and enjoyable and you're going to have new relationships with people, um, including, including curators and other artists in your community. Um, so that, uh, goes into a little bit about also, um, the second piece of advice, which is not to put somebody on the spot. So, um, sometimes this is inevitable, but it, lots of times it's, it's kind of about finesse and, and you figure out this, the more conversations that you have about your work or the more opportunities that you pursue, but, you know, talking to somebody about an opportunity and then immediately saying, so can I have a show? Well, most people aren't like, you know, planning their exhibition calendar right there on the fly, or they're not, you know, there's lots of things under consideration when somebody um, offers an artist an opportunity. So for, you know, you to expect an answer in the middle of like a ca casual conversation or a portfolio review or something like that, um, you're not, for one, you're not going to usually get a yes or no answer on the spot like that. Um, because like I said, people aren't just like looking at their calendar for the year and deciding that on, on the fly. But um, it's also kind of makes them awkwardly have to say yes or no to you. And you don't want them to land on a no because they have to in the moment because they're not going to commit to something rather than the, giving them the, the time to actually think about your work more and think about your conversation and their interaction with you and meeting you and all of that. So it's to your benefit to give give them the time and space to to think about your work and that interaction beyond, again, that moment or that transaction. Uh, sh make sure to uh, practice and show reciprocity. So it's not just about, again, the transaction of you are offering this opportunity to artists. I want to have an exhibition. Can I have it? But it's, it's, or like, or like, I want to talk to you all about my work and tell you everything that I'm working on and dominating the conversation, but also showing the, those curators that you're talking to or those, those organizers or those, those peers in the community that you care about what they're working on. Ask them, you know, what do you have in development? What projects are you, are you excited about? What, what are you hoping to do in the next couple of years? Um, you know, exhibition wise or project wise or community wise. Um, and by, by doing that, you are showing reciprocity. You're not just saying it's about me and it's about my work, but it's also about what you're doing. And in doing so, they might, you know, reveal to you that they're working on a project and you find out, well, wow, I'm working on the, 
the exact things, you know, the exact same themes that are really related, you should come over, you should come to my studio for a studio visit. And so then things begin to develop naturally, conversationally, organically, and it doesn't feel like you're forcing somebody into the, into, you know, uh, a situation or, or trying to force your work into a context where it doesn't really fit at that moment. Um, again, investing in your community, this looks like a variety of things. This looks like you you going to to public programs, to exhibition openings, supporting your peers, supporting other artists in whatever way you can. Maybe it's sharing knowledge. Maybe it's sharing resources. Maybe it's offering free workshops. Um, maybe it's being an educator through programs and you know after school programs or museum programs or um, or education programs in in schools. Whatever way that you can figure out how to use your skills as an artist, use your the resources that you do have, figure out how you can use those to invest in your community. And you, your community is going to want to invest back in you. Um, all the, always be meeting people. So this goes back to building relationships. Um, and in doing so, you're, there, there's, there's never an opening or a program I go to where I don't meet a new artist or a new organizer, a new curator in the community that I that I didn't already know. Um, so it's always there's always new opportunities from meeting new people, getting their perspective on on things, and 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 being exposed to other parts of the community that are that you're unaware of, um, and and learning how how they work, what they're passionate about, and maybe if there's opportunities for collaborations. Uh, understand the timelines that organizations and, and curators are working on is really important to approaching curators or having conversations about your work. Um, a lot of times as artists, especially um, starting out, you're used to working on uh, you know, coming out of school or something, you're used to working on a lot shorter timelines, like maybe you're working on a project for like only three months or six months or a year. Um, in in the world of museums um, or or nonprofit organizations, lots of times you're you're planning your calendar or your exhibitions anywhere from like one year to three years out and larger institutions probably even far, farther out, maybe even up to five years out. And that's because it's a lot of work to coordinate an exhibition. And also, um, it's really, it's really um, time consuming to also secure funding for those exhibitions. And those funders that are funding organizations are working on timelines again, one year, two years, three years out. Um, so you have to be able to talk about what you're going to do two years from now. So when you as the artist have a conversation with the curator, there might not be an opportunity that's going to be available for another three years or two years um, because they've already planned their calendar for the next two years. So that's important to understand is what timeline, timelines people are working on um, because or or just kind of knowing that general piece of information because that's going to help you al align your expectations with reality. You know, thinking like, oh, I'm trying to apply and get all these shows for this year. Well, most people's calendars might be booked for the year um, with the exception of maybe artist-run spaces or um, smaller commercial galleries, which um, are funded either like an artist-run space often by the artists in the space or are self-funded. So they are uh, they're able to work on um, shorter timelines and maybe have a little bit more flexibility in their schedule um, because they don't have so many working parts to kind of juggle in realizing a project. Um, when you're approaching curators and thinking about um, opportunities, think in the long term. So this feedback feeds back into all of these things, but you know, it's not about if you just get one, the first opportunity or one specific opportunity that you apply for. Um, sometimes it's, again, just about introducing your work to somebody. It's about starting a relationship. And you don't know if two years or three years from now, they're working on a project and they remember your work and, and realize like, oh, the the themes of what I'm working on for this show, I remember seeing this artist and this really fits to get, their work would really fit. I'm going to check in with them and see what they've been working on. 
Um, so you, you don't know what's going to happen over the, over the course of your, your career. Um, so don't be thinking about things again on the short term, on the single opportunity, whether or not you get it and thinking about tr it transactionally and thinking about things in the long term and about investing in your community and showing reciprocity. That's also going to affect your, your attitude and your tone and how you treat people. Um, because you're thinking about having a relationship with this person over many, over many years and being, you know, colleagues and friends and peers in the community um, versus like what they can do for you and then being mad or disgruntled when, when things don't work out the way you expected. Um, when you're approaching curators, also think about, or applying for an opportunity, think about the, the factor of your saturation. And so what I mean by that is, um, in your, maybe this more applies more to your direct local art, art community, but, um, has your work been exhibited like five times in the last year, or have you been in, been in multiple shows that kind of have been circling around the same theme and what the result can be is, um, it, there's, there's, you know, becomes less interest in it because it's, because it, it's kind of been saturating, um, saturating one community or sa or saturating one kind of line of conversation. Um, and, uh, for instance, you know, if an artist has shown, you know, five times or even, I would say even like three times, they've had like three solo shows in our community and then they apply, I, I'm going to feel less compelled to show that artist's work because their work has been seen so many times in the last year. So, our programming isn't going to feel unique and special. It's not going to feel like it's offering something new to the community. The community is going to, uh, the community of, of viewers, of artists uh, and all of that, they're not going to feel like they're seeing something new. And also that opportunity is not going to, is not going to feel like it's, it's as well used because this, you know, an artist who's had such saturation is they have opportunities. They, they are, they have traction with their work. And so it's, it's not going to feel as important for, for an, an, an impactful for the organization to award that person an exhibition or an opportunity when, when they've had so many. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that can be some outcomes of your work heavily saturating, um, uh, a, a, an art community or kind of like a line of, of exhibitions that are developing. Um, make sure to ask for recommendations. Maybe you talk to a curator and it, and it becomes kind of clear like, oh, they're, they're really only interested in printmaking or that's really the focus of the projects they're working on for the next few years. And I've been making ceramics. Maybe um, it's not the right fit, but maybe they have recommendations for other curators they know or other organizations that my work would be a great fit for. Um, so never, never you know, never think like, oh, this door is closed. Always use that, always use meeting those new people or people or even just who's already in your network to, to expand what you know, to expand who you know, and to expand um, what you're, you're aware of. Because we're all always learning about things all of the time, learning about organizations, learning, learning about other artists, learning about curators and getting to know what their interests are. And so there's a potential for overlap and, um, co and connection. And the last, the last point is to do your research. So just like researching if a, if a, um, organization is a right fit for you, you're, you also can know, you know, if this, if a curator is going to be receptive to your work by looking at what are the other things that they've worked on in the past and, um, what, uh, again, you know, asking what are, what are their projects they're excited about, you know, that they're, that they're developing now, maybe what, what's the organization's mission? What do they show? So understanding, um, where they're coming from, what they're working on and, that'll give you a better understanding if they're the right fit. But also when you're, when you go into having the studio visit or, sh or introducing your work, then that also gives you direction on what to focus on. And that leads into the last bit of, of advice, which is 
um, having that studio visit. So in all of those last things, when you're working, when you're thinking about things conversationally, it, it feels natural to just say like, hey, do you want to have a cup of coffee? Um, I'd love to have you over for a studio visit. And that's it. It's, a, it's you giving an invitation. And it's not about you sharing an expectation. Um, so it's simply that you're an artist and you want to share your work. Um, and so once you get that curator or whoever it is over for a studio visit, um, you want to think about what you want to share with them in advance. So that's through your research of knowing what they're interested in, but also thinking about your body of work and what you're excited to share. So think about that in advance, prepare for your studio visit, and don't just simply kind of go on the fly um, and be randomly like pulling stuff out and you, you know, it's like half wrapped, you're not really prepared, you don't have stuff set up. Um, sometimes somebody, you know, curators are doing multiple studio visits in a day. Um, that's often, that's often the case where they have, you know, maybe like pockets of time in their annual schedule that they dedicate to studio visits. And so they're kind of all like packed in together. Um, so you want to, you want that to be a good experience and not to feel disorganized. Um, in preparing, ask the curator if there's a specific body of work that they want to see. There might be a couple works that they Maybe they're working on a project and they have a couple of pieces in mind um, that they want to add a, have in that show. Then you're also going to kind of know from that selection what other peripheral things they might be interested in. And again, asking them what projects they're working on, that'll give you some direction as well. Don't feel like you have to prove your skill set. This is something that um, a lot of young artists or artists that are inexperienced um, I see do where they want to show like I can paint I can draw or I like I do like I can do everything I do all of these things and so they show su like such su for a lot of stuff but then it's also like it feels um, unfocused because it's it's more it feels like trying to prove what you can do as an artist versus just showing your work and talking about your work. So don't feel like you have to prove yourself as an artist and your technical skill or anything like that. Just simply share your work, share what you're working on, share what you're passionate about. Um, and, um, and a lot of people are most excited to see what's in progress, like what are you working on right now? Um, and going along the lines of not feeling like you have to prove yourself, um, understand that any space that you have to present your work is fine. It's about you. It's about your work. It's not about, you know, if you have a huge studio, um, if you, if you have a space that's like separate from your house or something like that. Um, nine times out of 10 people, at least in Texas, um, people's studios are at their, are at their homes. Um, lots of times it's, a guest room, their garage, lots of times it's their kitchen table. It's it's really about doing the work to prepare and figuring out how you can best present your work. So however you need to lay that out so people can really see the work, um, you know, and clearing other maybe distractions out of the space. Um, so you're creating the environment for a good studio visit. That's what's important. It's not you know, the architecture or the structure of the space that you, that you have or proving you're a serious artist by having like a separate studio somewhere else in town or anything like that. So don't get hung up on, on those kind of things. Focus on what you're making and how and what is a strong presentation of it. Um, after the studio visit, it's always a good idea to follow up and um, just, you know, sharing thank you for coming to the studio visit. Here's some of the stuff that we looked at, maybe attaching a few images and, um, and saying, um, you know, and, and just using that as an opportunity to keep the conversation going. Sometimes that's over months. You don't always have to like write it in a way that you expect to reply, but just, you know, so your name or whatever. So you're, so that you're not forgotten about or, or so it's also like, can, can I add you to my newsletter? That kind of, that kind of stuff where it's just a line of communication and it's just about sharing your work and keeping in touch and not about, um, you know, asking for some kind of expectation. The last thing I want to share with you is my email address. 
feel free to email me with any questions you have about this content. Hopefully it helps you um, on your future applications and forming uh, stronger representations of your work to go out there and pursue opportunities. I will also include a list of opportunities, um, exhibition opportunities and residencies and grants, things, of the, things like that um, that you can apply for as an artist. Um, I'll include those links in the, the notes for, for this tutorial. Okay, bye.